the great breakthrough painting was happening at one place at one time. Think of it. It wasn't happening in Boston or California, Wisconsin, Chicago, wherever, only in New York and only in a part of New York, the Cedar Tavern and the club. That's where they all were. All the great painters were there every day at the same time for several years. And I always use a, a metaphysical idea that there is a G point. The earth revolves, you know, and there's a ray that hits a point like it did in Paris in the turn of the century. Well, it turns around and around, and then it finds another point, Cedar Tavern, and that's where it blossoms. So I call it the G point, <laughs> gravity, God. The feeling was that it was a place that was needed because there were a lot of people going to the Cedar Tavern, and there was a big hullabaloo about the new painting. That's important to understand. Pollock had made had his first exhibition at Peggy Guggenheim's. That was even before I left Italy. Why were they there? They were all there like going for the gold rush, finding the vein, the gold. What is this new mysterious painting? They were checking out each other. That's why they, they established a dialogue over a glass of beer. And they all went there because de Kooning would go there, a Pollock would go there. Pollock was living in East Hampton, but de Kooning was in, in, the, in the Bowery, and he would be close by, he'd go, to the, go for a drink at the, at the Cedar Tavern, and Klein would be at the bar, you know, expounding this whole new philosophy with his double talk, you know. And the young kids were around, amazed by this new jargon of uh, metaphysics, let's say, you know. Is it or isn't it, you know? Is it space or not space? What is space? What is negativity? What is light? What is time? All of a sudden, they never heard of it before. And they all were gathering there every day, morning, afternoon, and night, they were there. And then the club starts because they, the overflow of the Cedar Tavern caused the club. They were all going to the club then. Philip Revere sponsored it with his own money. I give credit to Philip, all of it. And he held, he led with a, an iron fist too. And then there was that surrealist thing with Peggy Guggenheim. And then there was the, um, well, there was Marcel Duchamp and the surrealist came, Breton came, uh, and Gorky had his first show with Julian Levy because of Breton's influence discovers Gorky and claims are like a surrealist. And he has a show, and Gorky becomes like a new painter on the scene. He was known before underground, but now he came with new painting on the influence of Mata. And his painting changed, and he was no longer painting in the same manner. He's painting in a surrealist, dealing with symbolism, unconscious elements, liquid paint, fluid, and so on. And that's when it all begins to show that there's an American scene happening. And Pollock comes down at the same time, in a way. See, but Gorky dies in 1948 by suicide. So at that time, the, uh, Pollock was soaring as new, the, the new painter, and a new kind of painting was on the scene. After the Peggy Guggenheim show, he was, uh, he was lauded by uh, James Johnson Sweeney, who bought She-Wolf, I think, for the Modern Museum. He was director of the Modern Museum at the time. So this is what I'm trying to say. There is now a change in climate, aesthetic climate, in New York City. It's no longer social realism. It's not the Whitney Museum annual, where Philip Guston would be always honored as a pr the pr the prize painter, you know? There's an underground coming up and changing the whole scene. And then, of course, de Kooning comes along. He's an underground painter. All the painters knew about de Kooning's work before he showed. He showed in 1948 in, at, uh, at uh, Charlie Egan. His first show was in 1948. And then he became a big success because Pollock had already shown before de Kooning. See? And all the, fa the people following de Kooning's new uh, explosion, we would say, on the scene with all the people backing him, Carol Rosenberg and Tom Hess and his wife and Charlie Egan, the gallery dealer, 
They were claiming him as the new painter, as the, the new Cezanne, they called him. But they weren't talking about Pollock. Pollock had already done what he had done, and the painters knew who he was. The Kooning definitely knew who Pollock was, and so did Franz Klein and, and Rothko and all. They knew who he was. Rothko himself was not accepted as an abstract expressionist. He is today. They all put them in the same melting pot. But, but Rothko was in California with Clifford Still working, and so was Hans Hoffman. Hoffman comes from California, comes to New York, opens a school, and it's a very important school. And a lot of the young painters you know, including myself, worked with him, see? And then Pollock knew, Pollock knew uh, Hoffman, very, and his wife studied with him. Lee was a very good Hoffman student. Max Ernst had a show at the time, and I knew Max Ernst too very well. And Max was having a show with Alexander Yolas uptown in the Hugo Gallery. And, and uh, because he was having a show, he was living with his wife, Dorothea Tanning, in Arizona, like seeing American landscape and living there. And he was doing some sculpture in, in the desert there. And he came back, had a show in uh, Yolas, and then that was a talk. He was a surrealist. He was a historical figure in surrealism. They asked him to come to the club, and they really were not polite to him at all, I must say. A lot of the eager beavers, I call them, thinking they, were, they knew more about art than Max Ernst, you know, because they were part of the new painting. They were riding it high, but they were riding de Kooning and Pollock, you see? You follow these the young people. They all became famous later, you see. First it was called abstract expressionism. Then Harold Rosenberg comes around with another philosophy. He says, call it the New York School, action painting. They didn't want any linkage to anything surreal or European. That, that was all part of what was being given through Peggy Guggenheim's gallery, a lot of the surrealists they were very sophisticated people, by the way. The Americans were just living on, in the Bowery. They were still, they had hayseed in their hair still, you know. They were still in their studios checking out Cezanne. You know, these other guys were all way beyond that. They've been nurtured in Paris uh, history, you see, up to Cezanne and beyond, into surrealism. And that, that was where Pollock comes in. Pollock gets it from that period in, when he was working for Peggy Guggenheim. The, the stable gallery, I had to find artists. We had no artists in the gallery at all, none. So I had to scout for, to make a stable of artists to start a gallery. And I asked this woman, Ellen Ward, what kind of a gallery does she want to have? You know, I thought, so her gallery, it's not mine. And she said, well, I just want to have a gallery of painters. I said, no. I said, you know, the, you could have a, a middle of the road kind of a gallery. You could have a, a, a portrait gallery. You could have, you know, so many different categories of galleries. I said, oh, do you want to be avant-garde? She didn't know what that meant. I said, well, to explain that to you, in the last issue of Vogue magazine, there was an article on Betty Parsons about the avant-garde painters, you know, Pollock and de Kooning, blah, blah, blah. Not the Kuni, he was not there, but Pollock and uh, Rothko, I think, and uh, Gottlieb, uh, Barnett Newman were with Bar Betty Parsons at the time. I said, that woman, Betty Parsons, has what I call an avant-garde gallery, and it's the new painting that's happening now. Now, that's what I mean by, she said, that's what I'd like to do. I said, well, under that case, I could help you there, because I'm one of them, you know? <laughs> so I know them all, and I said, uh, We'll start looking for artists. She had the stable. There was, she didn't have one artist in the gallery, really. You know? And I said, I went to scout. I said, give me the freedom to go looking around, see an exhibition, see what's happening in the New York scene. And I went to, to Coote's gallery one time, and he had a show of about 20 young painters. See? And I looked at that show, and I looked at Twam, and I said, aha, there's a guy I'd like to know more about. So then I found out, I went to tell her about Twomley. I said, I saw a painter that I think we ought to look at, and I want you to know who he is. She says, let's go see who he is. You know what? And we, went to, we found out that he was living in the, downtown New York, 
and he was living with Rauschenberg. So we went to see them both. And I said to him, we saw a painting of yours. We're starting a new gallery, and we're interested only in young painters because we want to uh, nurture them and you know, build them up and give them opportunities because we're being backed by uh, money that we can afford to lose money, see? So then he said, well, uh, I'm flattered to ask me, you know? He said, I'll come and look at it, look at the gallery. When he came to see the stable gallery with Rauschenberg, he loved it, you know? And then he said to me, he says, well, I said, what about it? You gonna come and join us? He says, well, he speaks with a southern accent, you know? He says, well, I'll be interested if you take Bob too. And I said, absolutely, take you both down. That's how we got him. See? Amazing. And then, of course, I knew Joseph Cornell, you see? Mm -hmm. And I said, the reason for the gallery was a concept, again, you see, it was not just opening a gallery of avant-garde. It was a gallery that had artists whose spirit, whose poetic, poetics would make art meaningful. Abstract expressionism at the time had a very formal base to it, and it had a very loose elbow cord of painting, you know, that had something that would happen accidentally. Apart. Yeah, apart, yeah. That had some, no, it had some geometric uh, cubist ideas behind it, yeah. but it didn't have content, you see. And I thought that these artists like Cornell, they were poets, you see. That, that's what the painter should have. Pollock has it, see. And then, John, then I found John Graham, who was a figurative, I wanted a figurative painter. I, I never saw his painting, ever. But I read his book and I said, that man knows something. I said, we got to find him. And then I found him through people who knew him. And nobody knew where he was. They didn't know where he was. They knew him. The Kooning knew him, Elaine de knew him, the Marcarelli knew him, Philip Avia knew him. But I said, where is this guy John Graham? And they didn't know why I was, I was interested. He's not an abstract expressionist, you know? And I said, I want to know what, where he is and what he's doing. So Conrad said, well, the last I saw him, I said, what did he paint like the last time you saw him? He says, well, he was doing women with cross eyes, you know, daggers in their throats, a horse lining up on his hind leg. I said, like Uccello, a little bit like that? He says, yes, yeah, similar, but modern. Sort of had a sort of esoteric symbols on the paintings, you know. I said, that's just what I want. I want a figurative painter that's not naturalistic, you know, not an academician, and not social realism either. I want a metaphysical painter, figurative. And I found him. I found him through a, 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 a book dealer in East Hampton. I said, do you know the work? Of, you know John Graham? He says, yeah, why? I said, where the hell is he? He says, why, Nick, he's living in Southampton, in the next town. <laughs> and nobody knew, nobody knew where he was. So I went to see him. So you found, and so then you I found him, and we got him. And yes, we had him. We had him for three years. Yeah. And then I had, uh, then we got Noguchi. Then I had even Joan Mitchell came in later. Uh, quite a few, we all became well known. Marcarelli, I was a pal of mine. I put him in the gallery. <laughs> um, uh, Jack Twalkup came in the gallery, John Ferrin, uh, Elaine de Kooning later. Abstract painting was action painting, uh, dealing with cubist ideas, uh, they're dealing with optics, they're dealing with um, just action, you know, space. They were dealing with space, but they weren't dealing with having content. The surrealists had the content. Right? The way of getting at the content, we all have it. Everybody has it. It's a question of how you tap that source in you to give it meaning as a narrative and a symbolism. The poet, the poet in you. They want to analyze paintings by see the divided here, the plane is here, the color relations here, the, the, that. Nonsense. It's not that. It's okay academically, I would say, it's okay. You take, teach a child to walk, but then he's got to dance. You see? When he dances, he's creative. What does he do when he dances? Is it physical? No. It's not physical. He moves space, and space has an, is an image. 
when the dancer use, makes a movement from one field to the other field of the stage, what the shock that you get is that the awesome event is that the unseen is what you get as sensation. When you're dealing with mass and equations, you go to field, and field is light and space. And then in that, there is a kind of pulsation of content. It's not just a colored surface. See, most people think of that. The imitators would paint a Rothko and say, orange paint, and then a green and a black, you know. But Rothko didn't paint that way. There were skins of his painting, one over the other, that evolved into a certain kind of feeling. It's an emotive thing, sensation again. It's not literal, it's not optics. Well, what, what about Ed Reinhardt? You know, same thing, black black same so. thing, same thing. Of... But I think Roth, Rothko in the late paintings, before he died, I, I was there practically when he did them, by the way. Mm -hmm. I saw him paint them. Uh, he was interested in, in that. He was worried about the paintings that he did for the Demonil collection, you know, in, in St. Thomas. Uh, he showed me, they came back to him in his studio. They were shown, uh, the, they came back, they were, uh, they were going to be at Seagram's building, I think, the paintings that he did at that time. And he showed it to me and he said, what do you think? I said, well, Jesus, they're sort of ominous and dark. Doing is prayer, let's put it that way. Work is prayer. Uh, to, to work is to become conscious. To, to evolve is an evolutionary process for self-consciousness, you see, you know, through the work. And the work has to have a metaphysics behind it, a philosophy, otherwise it's optical. You're dealing with optics. You're dealing with traditional canons. Great art, a great painting, a masterpiece, is a spiritual thing. It's an icon that you go to, you go to it to ask a question. And if you don't know how to ask the question, you'll never get the answer. If I spit on the floor now, and I go, and I splash sputum all over that place, what do you see? I say to my student, what do you see? You know what they all say? Well, I see spit. I says, well, then you're not an artist. See? I said, if you saw a dragon or an angel or a bird, or flower, then you're an artist.